Welcome to our fourth and final video in our series on genetics. In this part, we're going to look at genetic mutations. When we look at genetic mutations, we look at them on two different scales, gene mutations and chromosome mutations, and it really is all about scale. So here's a picture of a chromosome. It's in the duplicated state. But if we're going to talk about gene mutations, we need to look deep inside of a chromosome and zoom in on the DNA, the genetic code all the way down to the nucleotides, the adenines, the guanines, and cytosines, and thymines. So when we look at gene mutations like base substitutions, base insertions, and base deletions, we've got to look at this picture over here on the right. But when we look at chromosome mutations, we're going to talk about changes in chromosome structure or changes in chromosome number. And we're going to look at it on this scale. So it's really a scale thing. And with changes in chromosome structure, we're going to look at things like chromosomal deletion, duplication, inversion, and translocation. And with changes in chromosome number, we're really going to be spending most of our time, or all of our time, in that part looking at non-disjunction. And after we do that, we'll spend a little time talking about a couple of interesting human genetic disorders. So let's start with gene mutations, looking at the DNA ladder. Now, we talked about this back in our videos on protein synthesis, so I'm going to actually go back to that video and we were looking at the DNA ladder and how we go from DNA to RNA and RNA to the amino acid sequence and it's at this level that we can talk about point mutations or gene mutations and the first one we'll remind ourselves of was a base substitution if I substitute this G, this guanine, for let's say an adenine well that single base substitution shows up when we transcribe from DNA to RNA so that this C, the complement to the A, is a U now what does that mean for our amino acid sequence? Well, the codon CCU, when we look at a codon chart, codes for proline. Look, we can see it here, CCU, proline. But if we change that code, if we change that G to an A, which changes the C to a U, then the codon UCU no longer codes for proline. In fact, it codes for serine. U, C, U, serine. So that single point mutation, that base substitution, changed the amino acid sequence that we have. Well, let's look at a different base substitution. What if we substitute this A, and instead of that A, we have a G? Well, that changes this codon from CCU to CCC. And CCU translates to proline but what about CCC? When we look at our codon chart, we said CC, CCU was proline, but CCC is huh, proline. So sometimes a base substitution has zero effect because of the duplication in the genetic code. So that's what base substitutions look like. Let's look at a base insertions and base deletions. And we'll start with a base insertion. In fact, we'll just do a base insertion because it kind of has the same effect. So if I were to insert or add a T into this code, let's push that T on in there. Well, look how it changes things. When we read DNA code, we have to read in frames of three, but I have four letters here. So I need to shift my reading frames. So we'll shift those up. Well, when we transcribe, that's going to shift our reading frames here in the messenger RNA. And when we translate, that's going to change many of our amino acids. Uh, and I kind of messed this up because it shifted and made a stop codon here in the middle. But the point is, this leads to what we call a frame shift. By adding a letter, we shift all of our reading frames, and it's going to change all the amino acids from that insertion point forward. And if we were to look at a base deletion, we'd see the exact same thing. We'd just be shifting in a different direction. So base insertions and base deletions lead to frame shifts. Now let's move on to chromosome mutations, specifically changes in chromosome structure. We have deletion, duplication, inversion, and translocation. We'll start with chromosomal deletion. It's when a section of a chromosome is missing. So we go from a chromosome that looks like this, and I put letters on here to represent you know, different sections of genes along this chromosome. Um, we have many genes on one chromosome, and for deletion, we've lost part of a chromosome, so it's pretty simple. Well, 
let's bring it back to normal for and move it down a little bit for our next one. In chromosomal duplication, it's when a section of chromosome is repeated. So maybe this happens. You can see the repeated section here. The B and the C genes are being repeated or duplicated. How about chromosomal inversion? So when a section of chromosome is inverted, so it breaks off, turns over, and reattaches. Now, we didn't lose any genes, and we didn't gain any genes, but we did change the order. Instead of A, B, C, D, it's now C, B, A, D. And sometimes the order is important. Let's take it back to the beginning again, and let's look at chromosomal translocation. When a section of a chromosome breaks off, and reattaches to another non-homologous chromosome. So we need another chromosome, so I'll bring this one in. It has a whole different set of genes on it. And for translocation, part of the chromosome breaks off and relocates or translocates onto a non-homolog. And again, we don't lose any genes, but we certainly change our linkage groups. So there we have, only back up a little bit, there we have our um, changes in chromosome structure. Now let's move on to our changes in chromosome number or non-disjunction. Let's start by looking at this karyotype. Look at it for a second. Pause the video if you need to. Do you see anything unusual? Anything out of the ordinary in this picture of the chromosomes? How about now? We call this trisomy 21. We're supposed to have two of every chromosome because we receive one from each parent, but for some reason we have three of chromosome number 21. Do you know what that's called? Pause the video and look it up if you don't. Did you do a quick Google search? Well, it's Down syndrome. Having three of chromosome number 21 is a interesting genetic disorder. It's a pretty common genetic disorder, but let's talk about how it comes about. Before that, hold on. Let's look at this one. Do you see anything unusual in this karyotype? Pause if you need to. Or I'll just give you a hint. How about looking down here? We have an extra sex chromosome. We have two X's and one Y. This is called Kleinfelter syndrome. Here I'll give you one more. See if you can find the mistake in this karyotype. And uh, I'll give you another little hint. We're missing our second sex chromosome. We have an X and nothing. Well this is called Turner syndrome. And what all these have in common is that they're caused by non-disjunction. We have an improper chromosome number. So let's look at how this might happen. We had to study non-disjunction. And to study non-disjunction we really need to look back at meiosis. Now if you haven't watched my video on meiosis, I'm going to put a link right here. You probably should look at it first. But here we have a germ cell, a cell that's going to give rise to gametes through meiosis. We know that we're going to replicate our DNA. We get to prophase 1, and of course during prophase 1 of meiosis, tetrads form. The homologs pair up. And at metaphase 1, those tetrads line up on the equator. And at anaphase 1, homologous chromosomes separate. Except for when they don't. This is disjunction. The chromosomes have come apart. Junction means to come together, so to disjunction means to come apart, and non-disjunction is going to be a failure of these chromosomes to come apart. So what if this happened? See the mistake? This is non-disjunction when homologous chromosomes fail to separate at anaphase. Well, let's finish meiosis and see what the result is. We go from there to the end, telophase 1, and we go through our second round of division of meiosis 2. And notice these two chromosomes, or this duplicated chromosome, should be over here. Let's see if we can pick that one up. We can't. If we can, this chromosome should be over here. We can see the mistake. But the cell continues on with its division, and we move forward. And at the end, we have our final cytokinesis, and we have our gametes. And in our gametes, we're supposed to be haploid one of each chromosome. So in this case, each of these cells should have one long chromosome and one short one. But this one's missing one, or these both of these are missing one. One of these short ones, either the red short one or the yellow short one, should be over here. And these gametes are haploid 
plus an extra chromosome. So the result of non-disjunction, this mistake germiosis, is the formation of gametes with the wrong number of chromosomes. So we can summarize the process here. We see the non-disjunction event, germiosis 1. Yeah, it's right there. But what if happens if the non-disjunction event happens later? We can see here in the meiosis 1 at the first anaphase we have the proper disjunction of the chromosomes. But what if it happens here at anaphase 2? Well, the only difference is we end up with two of the gametes that have properly formed haploid and one that's an are n plus 1 missing a chromosome and one that's an n sorry n minus 1 missing a chromosome and one that's an n plus 1. So, slightly different outcomes, but Nonetheless, we have these gametes with the improper number of chromosomes. So there's a slight difference whether or not the non-disjunction happens at the first meiosis, uh, the first anaphase, or during the second anaphase in meiosis 2. But big deal. We've made gametes with the wrong number of chromosomes. No harm, no foul. Really. At this point, this is not a problem. It's only if we use these gametes in fertilization event that this is a problem. So let's check out what would happen if we did use these gametes. A normal gamete should be haploid, having one long chromosome and one short, for our example. Now, what if one of these n minus 1 gametes was fertilized by a normal gamete? The fertilization event would result in a zygote that's diploid, except that it's missing a chromosome. For this chromosome, it's monosomy. Well, conversely, what about on the other side? If we have fertilization of one of these n plus or n plus one chromos um, cells gametes with a proper gamete, our zygote's going to be haploid plus an extra chromosome or trisomy. Now, having a whole extra chromosome or missing a whole chromosome, well, that's kind of a big deal. There's lots of genes on those chromosomes, and a lot of times that leads to these syndromes that we're going to talk about. So. Human genetic conditions caused by non-disjunction. We've already saw a, um, a karyotype of trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. We can end up with two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome with Klinefelters. And we saw that uh, karyotype. We also saw a karyotype of Turner syndrome, where we had an X chromosome with no partner. And we can also get three X chromosomes. We call that metafemale. And we have the XYY condition. Now, notice how so many of these have to do with the X and Y chromosomes, and we'll get to that in a minute. But why is there no monosomy 21 syndrome? There's a trisomy 21, and statistically, for every time that we could get a trisomy event, we should have the corresponding monosomy event. And the answer lies in the fact that having an extra chromosome 21 seems to be a viable offspring, but missing a chromosome 21 does not. Why is there no y not syndrome? We have an x not syndrome. Well, the answer is there are too many important chromosomes on the X, or genes, I should say, on the X chromosome. But we can't live without a y chrom or an X chromosome. Why is there no trisomy 14 syndrome? Meaning, and I just picked the number 14 out of the air, but Down syndrome, trisomy 21, is a well-known genetic difference but we don't know of any tr other trisomy events outside of the sex chromosomes. Well, we don't know the answer to that. It seems to be that trisomy 21 is a viable um, offspring, a viable zygote, but the other trisomatic events or monosomatic events don't seem to be. Two more questions before I wrap up. It looks like I'm going to have to come back for my video on other genetic disorders. Uh, make a little short one after this one, but can you survive without a Y chromosome? Stop the video and think about that for a second. Well, I hope you figured out that, yes, of course you can, because women do it every day. There are no essential genes on the Y chromosome. Well, can you survive with only one X chromosome? Well, of course, men do it. So it makes sense that some of these possibilities are viable offsprings. We don't need a Y chromosome and only need one X chromosome. So um, while these are genetic differences, um, there are lots of people walking around with these disorders and you might never know it. They don't seem to convey any uh, too many outward signs or certainly not disabilities. More I would say differences. 
and we'll talk about these uh, in class more. But now I'm kind of up against it with time, so I'm going to come back and make part 4B where I talk about some human genetic disorders. So come back for that one, and I hope you learned something.